Okay, let's get started. So this week we're looking at financing company operations. So we're looking at share. So I think some of you may have already done a little bit on share stuff in 5013. All right, so hopefully it's a, um, most of it's revision. There's some new, new bits as well. Um, but before we get started, just so you know, on Blackboard, you've got already got selected homework questions to do before class next week. So those classes that are on here. Um, so 2.9, 2.11, 2.30, you've got answers to. So practice them because we won't go through them in class unless you have questions about them. Right, so we'll go through the other questions and we'll have a new question so that we're always trying to do, each week we're always trying to do something new. All right, so it's a good idea if you do those ones that you've got the answers to and then if you don't quite understand it, we can clarify it in the workshop next week. All right. Okay, uh, the other thing that you'll see I've put up on Blackboard as well, just a little summary for you with shares, about issuing shares, whether they are paid in full, whether there's monies on application allotment on whether there are further calls. So those um, are your summary journal entries. Those accounts that are listed in green are the temporary accounts. Right, so they are, if it's a temporary account, at some point it needs to be brought back to zero, either fairly early on or not too long after. The only one that stays there a little bit longer are the calls calls in advance. Okay, so let's have a look. So there's a lot of slides to get through today. We may or may not get through them all, but some of them are a little bit repetitive, so you've seen some of it before, so we'll go through it. Some of them are pretty self-explanatory, so it shouldn't be too hard for you. Okay, we're looking at Chapter 2, which is our company operations. We're going to highlight, um, we're going to focus on shares, we'll do some extra examples of debentures and that in the workshop. So uh, we'll look at under and over subscriptions, forfeiture, a couple of examples where we issue share options or bonus issues and rights issues um, and uh, have a look at the main account. So just so you know, hopefully it's pretty obvious if you're a company, one of the main advantages of being a company is the fact that you can raise lots of money. Right, so unlike um, partnerships and sole traders, you are limited to being able to raise money from those people investing, so your limited partners, or if you're a sole trader, the own mo your own money that you can put in, or that you can loan from a bank, where with the company, you can issue shares, so you can issue quite a lot. So there's lots of different types of shares as well. The types of shares you issue depend on the nature of your company and what you need. So different types of companies like exploration companies will have low value shares but maybe lots of them so that they can continue to keep raising um, money for ex exploration purposes until such time is they're able to say it's a mine, let's say it's gold mining, maybe they don't want to uh, create their own um, gold mining um, facility, you know, to be able to process a gold. Maybe they just want to package up it and sell it off to somebody else. That might be their purpose, so depending on their purpose. So you'll find that those kind of companies just tend to have lots of low value ordinary shares and they have a, um, quite a lot of calls on them where um, periodically, uh, whether it's annual, biannual, maybe every five years or just whenever they need it, they'll make calls of to, to raise, you know, maybe another two, five, ten, twenty million dollars, whatever. You find that the highest expenditure with those type of companies, exploration companies, is paying the salaries for geologists and people that go out exploring. All right, so um, when you start digging and you start digging down a lot, you um, you have to hire uh, the expensive drills and things like that, the diamond drills and the like, and they actually can get quite expensive. So if you're up to that stage of exploration, it can be quite expensive. All right, so you've got ordinary shares, preference shares, so lots of different types of preference shares, but your standard uh, advantage of a preference share is you get paid first before your ordinary shareholders. 
Right, so if you've got a 10% preference share, you're entitled to um, that 10% before your ordinary shareholders. If it is a cumulative preference share, in the event that you're unable to pay it because you don't have enough profits in one year, that accumulates, it continues to accumulate. If it's a redeemable preference share, it can have lots of different conditions attached to it, but the company can perhaps redeem that share. They might want to redeem shares if they want to maintain control and stop a hostile takeover, for example. Or alternatively, redeem them back, reduce the amount of share capital to boost the value of the company. Um, convertible shares, so you can convert shares from preference shares to ordinary shares or vice versa. But you can only do it if it's been set up that way from the beginning when you set up your company. Right? You can't just go and make up the rules as you go along. You have to set it up. Now, the other way that you can uh, get financing, uh, and remember the shareholders, what do they want? They want you to make profits and they want you to pay dividends. Right? Whereas debenture holders, they are usually entitled to a set amount of interest. So they get paid interest. It's like a loan, but most debentures, they can be secured or unsecured, meaning it could, they may have claims against assets or they may not, depending on how they're set up. So you lend them money in lieu of interest. So with your debt financing uh, and your debentures, the way that you classify them in your books can vary depending on the nature of those debentures and when the, when the money has to be paid. Where a debenture has a set date of being um, purchased back by the company, it gets treated as a liability. If it doesn't have a set date, then there's a number of rules you have to apply and you have to apply the financial instruments accounting standard to determine whether it is equity or if it's a liability. So that means on your balance sheet, does it sit under your liability or does it sit under your equity? All right, and that could have implications for a company uh, if they have other financing arrangements with other banks and debt to equity ratios and all that kind of stuff. So, and um, measures of risk. Um, the um, difference there with your um, debt financing, um, maybe you want to uh, issue debentures instead of shares because you want to keep control. Right, maybe you don't want to issue more shares because you don't want to disperse the control. You want to keep the value of that of those ordinary shares, um, <coughs> and it also, um, you know, might just be a cost-effective way of doing it. Issuing debentures instead of getting a loan from a bank, getting a loan from a bank could be quite expensive with the interest payments, whereas the interest on a debenture might be significantly lower. Say bank interest might be at 8%, you might only be paying 5% on a debenture. Okay, so again, it depends on the uh, nature of um, the company and their financing requirements. So just so you know that the amount of capital raised on the stock exchanges around the world is massive. 2016-17, it was about 52 billion in Australia. 2017-2018, it was closer to 80 billion in Australia. Right, so the markets around the world are still being able to um, generate monies and raise monies and uh, lots of new IPOs as well. So Singa Singapore is one area where there's uh, an IPO is an initial public offering where uh, new companies are starting out and getting established. So there's quite a few successful uh, little companies in Singapore. So if you um, having a, a look at... Um, international investment. Singapore is actually, they have quite good rules and regulations. They're obviously not the US or the UK or Australia, but they're wanting to uh, attract more business to, to them and for their markets to become a lot more successful. So just in this little graph, they might be sitting down here, but they're not the, certainly not the bottom. Right, it just means that on that one, that they're uh, lower than some of the big ones when you're comparing them but they're actually doing quite well. Okay, so uh, this here is just a little uh, illustration of some of the fees you pay. So in America, you might recall last week, I highlighted that to list on the New York Stock Exchange, it costs you millions and millions of dollars to do so. So not, not only just the initial setup costs, but the ongoing compliance. So in Australia, depending on the value of the securities, let's say if you have over a thousand million, so a billion shares, 
it's going to cost you 475000 plus 3% on any ex excess over that uh, 1000 million. All right, so that's your initial listing. Then you have annual listing fees as well. So these are ongoing listing fees that you have to pay the stock exchange. So that is just your listing fee. It's not all the other stuff on top of that, you know, where you've got your accountants that have to prepare everything for you. You have to lodge multiple documentation, lots of different things if you're a corporation. The Australian Stock Exchange and the Secur Securities Investment Commission demand accountability and transparency. And so with that, there's a lot of compliance, so a lot of forms and things to fill in. Um, in the event that your company starts to have abnormal returns, so they have sophisticated systems that are looking at share prices going up and down and that. So in the event that your company starts to have something which looks a little bit outside the ordinary, either it's going up too much or going down too much, outside of the parameters that they've set up in their modelling, based, remember their modelling is based on the information that you have provided to them. Companies are required to provide uh, quarterly forecasts of budgets and full disclosure about everything that's going on in the company and that all is supposed to get factored into the share price. If the share price is um, fluctuating too much or going up a little bit too much, they make more demands on you. They want to know why, what's going on, why is your share price going up, why are you... Because the idea is if markets are efficient, uh, you don't get abnormal returns. Right. So we know that in reality they can't possibly know everything. Um, and then sometimes, um, but this is where insider trading comes in, where if uh, somebody is able to jump in and maybe buy a whole lot of shares before an announcement gets made, and then they make a huge profit, uh, then you can get into a lot of trouble. Right. So initial public offerings, all right, is a, um, a prospectus is a, a disclosure document from an initial public offering. So that's a new company that's starting out. Now, just so that you're aware, there are a lot of scams around where people will say that they are starting up this company. You'll get a lovely glossy brochure. Happened to me once years ago. It's probably about 15 years ago now. But I lived in quite an affluent area and got a lovely glossy brochure saying that, and it probably would have cost them quite a bit of money to prepare all this documentation. Looked lovely. Um, but then when you do a little bit of research, you can go to the Australian Securities website, you can find out if it's a real company or not, and if they have got an initial public offering. Um, and this one didn't, but I wasn't, luckily for me, I wasn't interested in buying shares at the time, but a lot of people got stung. And what happened is they paid out, um, I think the, they got away with um, about uh, 40 or $50 million. Yeah, it happens. And you would be surprised at how often it happens. Because when if you uh, engage in that fraudulent kind of activity and you happen to go to the right area at the right time and people are a bit silly, if something looks too good to be true, it probably is. Right, but you know, there's a lot of people around that will be speculative and invest in new companies, even if they, because they're new, you don't know whether they're going to be successful or not. But what, if you get in on the ground, then the share price goes up, and then you can benefit. So that's why you find a lot of people will um, speculate on different, uh, here in Western Australia, a lot of um, mining companies, they'll speculate. Uh, you know, in anticipation of maybe the company doing well, right? But only speculate on those companies when, you, when they have a very clear directive about what they're doing and what their intentions are, right? If, if a company has an intention of creating a mine and mining, whether it's iron ore or gold or whatever mineral it is, then you know that they're going to get bigger and they're going to expand and they're going to have people but, I mean, you invest into those for the long term. Those are 20, 30-year investments, right? If a um, exploration company um, is going to sell off parcels when they find something to a company that is able to create a mine or whatever, 
then you have to be able to make sure that you're watching it all the time because the share price will only go up for a moment and then it'll come down because everyone will rush to go and buy shares in that company. Uh, it'll go up and then once they sell it off, um, then the share price goes down again because they no longer have that revenue earning capacity. All right, but I mean, it's speculative and it's risky, but it is possible to make money out of it. The thing is, when you have an initial public offering, there's potentially under and over subscriptions. So as an accountant, we have to uh, account for that. Um, most, um, okay, so a company can issue shares uh, on the terms and with rights and restrictions that the, that the directors determine. So they can issue ordinary and preference shares and uh, they have the right under the Act to convert ordinary shares to preference shares, so we know that. Uh, it specifically bans the conversion of a preference share that is not redeemable into a redeemable preference share. All right, so that's a protection of the rights of shareholders, so that's one specific. They can issue debt securities as well, so we know that. Um, so the company can demand payment in full. Alternatively, pay, payable on application or in calls. Um, and there are different number of different uh, accounts that facilitate this process. Okay, so no accounting entries are prepared when the invitation to subscribe is made. Accounting commences on the receipt of application forms and monies. All monies go into a cash trust account. Cash trust account is not yours until you have gone through the process and uh, allotted out those shares. All right. Often a, a cash trust account is actually administered by a third independent party as well. All right. It doesn't have to be, but sometimes when you're setting up a company and you're making sure that you've got good processes and systems and governance in place and all that kind of stuff, um, you might have an independent financial broker. Right. Um, so those are the accounts that we'll look at. So those are highlighted on the summary sheet that you've got as well. And we'll go through each of those. Those are green, uh, your temporary accounts. All right, so it's worthwhile until you get the hang of it and the hang of the names. Some variations on those names is fine. As long as it's clear um, what kind of account you're using, all right, that, um, that you don't, um, don't vary, it, vary it too much from the textbook on what we use. Uh, with the terminology. Let's look at a basic share issue. So a share which is fully payable on application. So on the 1st of July 2019, Epsilon Limited issued a prospectus offering 80,000 ordinary shares payable in full. So you know that you're going to get money going straight into your cash trust account uh, at an issue price of $2. So when the application's closed on the 13th of August, um, applications had been received for 110,000 shares. So it's oversubscribed by 30,000. Pretty obvious, 30,000 times two, 60,000 extra that you're gonna to have to give back to uh, applicants. All right, so the journal entries to record. So on the 13th of August, the 110,000 times two, 220,000 cash trust goes up. So we debit it, our application account goes up, so we credit it. So remember your application account is a temporary account and by the end of the process it needs to be zero. So you can see in the next journal entry, we take out the 80,000 shares times two, it's 160,000, comes out of our application account, we transfer that over to our share capital account. So we are registering the IPO 80,000 shares at $2, that is our equity. And we have to remove the remaining 60,000, which is 30,000 times two, out of our application account. And we uh, credit that to our cash trust because that money is going back as a refund. The last entry we do is we transfer the 160,000 in our cash trust to our bank account because that is our money now. All right, pretty straightforward. Where we have an under subscription, the disclosure document may specify that a minimum number of applications or minimum amount has to be received. You generally find that there are legal requirements for minimum subscriptions. So it's actually quite high. Um, now it depends on the nature of the business, the number of shares that you're issuing and 
to determine what that minimum is. And you'll find that a lot of IPOs will say that they want it 90% subscribed, but that would depend on whether it's fully paid or partly paid, right? If it is not fully uh, subscribed up to the point that they want, they can actually pay an additional fee for an underwriter and the underwriter agrees to purchase the remaining shares to get it to that minimum requirement. Okay, so whatever, whatever that is. So when a business is setting up, they need a minimum amount to get started and to have cash flow to be able to operate and do stuff. Right? If they don't reach that minimum requirement, they're not going to be able to start their business. So as part of their due diligence when they're setting up a company and all that stuff and making those decisions to list, they've gone through that process and worked out what that minimum is. But you'll generally find that um, most IPOs are not fully subscribed up front. They are, um, you generally find that they are partly subscribed, so you have money on application and then you ha might have a number of calls at a later date, right? And when you do that, the um, proportion of um, the amount that you need to get um, to go ahead with the IPO, um, you know, it varies, okay? It can vary. Um, but the underwriter, they have to pay some underwriter costs, um, can be quite expensive as well, all right? So the higher risk you are, the higher your underwriter costs. Because remember, the underwriter, he's buying these shares, right? So he's got to feel that, um, or that company, the underwriter, they have to feel that they're going to get value for money. So, okay, so where we have an oversubscription, the number of shares applied for may exceed, we can actually, um, depending, the, the directors make the decision on what they do. Usually they say up front what they're going to do, whether they pro rata it, so based on the number of people. So if you've applied for, you know, like they do it on a percentage basis, okay, based on what people have applied for, or alternatively, first come, first serve. All right, so it depends. They usually state in the IPO what it is, whether the directors will IPO, uh, whether they will pro rata, or whether they will uh, first come, first serve. First come, first serve, you need to make sure you get your if you're keen on buying into the company, get your application in early. All right, uh, extra monies that you receive, you either pay it back or you can keep it for calls. If, if it's payable in full up front, obviously you can't keep it, you've got to pay it back. All right, if you have calls that are going to come uh, into the future, you uh, keep that money in lieu of calls. Those calls monies, are treated as equity. Even though technically it's a liability, if you look at your definitions of your liabilities and equity, technically it is a liability. Um, but under the corporation's law and under the financial instruments, call monies are treated as contributed equity. Okay, because it's not unreasonable to assume that they've paid extra because they want those shares and they want to keep them. Right, that's not an unreasonable assumption. Okay, let's have a look at uh, issuing some shares, payable in instalments and oversubscribed. ABC has issued a prospectus for $100,000, $5 shares on the 1st of January. So we know that we've got uh, $500,000 worth of equity there. The prospectus requires a payment of $3 on application and $2 in one year's time. The company received applications for a total of 125,000 shares, so we're oversubscribed by 25,000 shares. On the 31st of January, they issued the 100,000 shares. So we have to um, account for, uh, prepare the journal entries to account for the issue, assuming the excess money is offset against the call due in one year's time. All right, so that's pretty straightforward. We receive our money, so we've got 125,000 shares at $3. Cash trust goes up, application goes up, 375,000. Okay, um, we are going to recognise our share capital now of 300,000. We've got 100,000 shares at $3, right? 25,000 at $3 is oversubscribed, but we're keeping the money, it's going into our calls in advance account. So we have 75,000 there. 
Notice that our application account is debited by 375. That account now is zero. All right. Um, last one, we're going to transfer all the cash from our cash trust account to our own business cash account, 375,000. All right, then in one year's time, we are going to have um, the call. So remember, we've already got those calls in advance of 75,000. We have to take it out of there, and now we need to recognise that as a part of our share capital. So our share capital, we've got 100,000 shares. Our call is for $2. 100,000 times 2 was 200,000. We've already got 75 of that. The balance that we're going to receive in our cash is 125, assuming they all pay. Okay, pretty basic. Let's um, bring our uh, a call account now back to uh, zero and transfer that 125,000 into our bank account with the last entry there. Okay, sometimes, however, when you have calls, depending on your, uh, how your constitution is set up, you might forfeit those shares. If you don't pay a call, uh, you may forfeit your shares. <coughs> Sometimes when you forfeit those shares, you get your money back. Sometimes you don't. Right? It depends on how the company was set up in the first place. But you'll find that um, quite a lot of the time, the businesses, they won't pay the money back. They'll keep that money. Those forfeited shares go into a reserve account as well. Okay? So the balance of paid monies may be retained by the company or the amount um, paid may be refunded back. So... Prior to um, refunding, uh, if they reissue those shares, any reissue costs come out of monies before it gets paid back as well. So um, the option is only available if the company's constitution states this fact. Okay, If it doesn't, they keep the money. So let's have a little bit of a look at our debits and credits for our forfeited shares. So... Uh, our forfeited shares account, we're, we're going to debit our share capital by the amount of the forfeited shares. So whatever they are, times by the amount called, we have to take it out. We have to make an adjustment there for our call and um, the uh, forfeited share money that's already been paid previously, so the share money that's been paid earlier before you forfeited, Okay, so you bought the shares, then you haven't paid the call, so it becomes a forfeited uh, share. All right, so whatever you paid up front, we need to account for that. So we adjust our forfeited shares, then we reissue them, but we might reissue them at a discount. We'll show you the debits and credits in a minute. Um, if we reissue them, obviously we're going to receive money from the new shareholders, right, and we're going to have to adjust our share capital. We also have to account for whether or not um, we're making a discount. That needs to come out of our forfeited shares account before we pay them back. All right, so let's have a look at a proper example here so it all makes sense. So on the 24th of May, a call for 20 cents per share was made on 200,000 shares with an issue price of $1.50 paid already up to $1.30. All right, so they've already paid in full up to $1.30, right? except on the 1st of June, all the money on the calls was received except for a parcel of 20,000 shares. Those 20,000 shares now become forfeited shares. So those um, on the 25th of June, the shares were reissued for $1.20, paid to $1.50. So that means they are being reissued at a discount. That discount needs to be taken out of the monies that were paid by the previous shareholders before they get paid back. So it needs to come out of there so they won't get a full refund. So they won't get $1.30 back per share. They will get whatever is left. All right, so it's going to be reduced by um, 30 cents and then any fees and costs. All right, so on the 24th of May, we make our call. So we debit our call account, 20 cents times by 200,000 shares gives you debit of 40,000. We're increasing our share capital, right, because we're asking for more money, so our share capital goes up. Right, we, need, we only received 
uh, 20 cents on 180,000 shares, 20,000 less. So our cash account is only going to be going up by 36,000. So remember, the cash trust account is only used in the beginning when you have an application. Okay, once the, once the shares have been allotted, calls go straight into your bank account. All right, so the trust account is only used in the first upon application. Anyway, next entry there on the 12th of June, we reissue those shares, uh, the share capital there of uh, 30,000. We need to um, account for uh, 20,000 shares at 20 cents, so 4,000 uh, that we haven't received. Our forfeited shares account there of 26,000, which is 20,000 times by a dollar 30. So we've got forfeited shares uh, of uh, 20,000. Our next entry there on the 25th of June, we're going to reissue those shares. All right, we're going to reissue them at a dollar 20. Um, then uh, we also have to account for the fact that uh, when we reissue them at $1.20, we're only receiving $24,000. $6,000 of that is basically the discount that we need to uh, remove before we pay them back in that last journal entry. We've got reissued costs that need to come out of that uh, forfeited shares account as well. So the last journal entry there, we've got $19,000 left. So we had 26000 from the previous journal in our forfeited shares account. All right, we had 26000 20000 times by $1.30. All right, we have reissued the shares at a discount. The discount was $6,000, so 26 minus a 6 plus the additional cost of 1000 means that we've only got 19,000 left. If we pay them back, we're only going to pay them back 19,000, not 26 of their original investment. Okay, so we know that there are underwriting costs. So your share issue costs, just so you know, share issue costs come off your share capital. Other formation related costs are, do not come off your share capital. So where you have um, startup costs, accounting fees, legal fees and things like that, they are treated as expenses. Right? Where your share issue costs actually get minus off your share capital and they are treated as a reduction against your equity. All right, the basic section of your balance sheet, the equity section in your balance sheet and in your statement of changes in equity, You've got your share capital, minus your calls in arrears, add your calls in advance, minus out any underwriting commission, minus out any share issue cost gives you your total share capital. Okay. All right, once you get going, you might have um, facilities to be able to um, issue more shares. Okay. <coughs> From time to time, you might have bonus issues or rights issues and uh, reasonings for enacting these. Could be reward, you know, for the company doing well. Maybe they want to change things around a little bit. Um, but a rights issue uh, allows you, for example, you know, um, for every four shares you hold, you have a right to buy another share. Right to reward the existing shareholders if the company is doing well and they want to buy new shares, more shares in the company, instead of offering it to the public, offering it to existing shareholders. They could be renounceable or non-renounceable, right? meaning they could be tradable or non-tradable right, shares. So maybe you don't want them to sell those shares and trade in those shares. They can only sell them back to the company. Right, if they're wanting to control, making sure that they're always maintaining like 51% of their company and not um, subjecting themselves to a hostile takeover. Um, when you are issuing more shares, note that it does dilute the share value if they are issued at a discount. Right, that can be problematic, could be fine, uh, an initial 
dilution of a share value might be fine because it might actually encourage more trading of your shares, more trading of your shares uh, maybe will eventually increase the price of your share right, or the value of your share. Um, all right, so it's a one for X rights, like if you've got four shares, so a one for one, one rights issue for every four that you hold or one for five, one for two, whatever. Okay, um, alternatively, you can have private placements where you issue shares, but to be able to do this, it needs to be in your constitution. Right, it needs to be in the company's constitution. You can't just do it for the sake of it. Um, often it is uh, that you have private placements to institutional investors. So those are very big companies. All right, for example, here in Australia, the primary institutional investors are superannuation funds, for example. Okay, accounting for these types of share issues does not involve the use of application and cash trust accounts. Because remember, those application and cash trust accounts relate to your initial public offerings when you get started. So when you get moving, uh, when the company gets moving, uh, those ca that cash trust account no longer gets used. It's only in the beginning. Right, so where you issue more and your share capital value um, changes and goes up and you get more cash, bank account goes up, share capital goes up. Okay, pretty obvious. Bonus issue. Okay, in the event that um, you're not able to pay dividends, right, maybe you want to reward um, or to encourage your shareholders to keep the shares in your company by giving them a bonus issue. Right? Sometimes um, bonus issues could also relate to employees, right, depending on the nature of the company and how it's set up. Um, with a bonus issue, there is no change in the net equity of the company um, because it's funded through reserves. All right, you can't have bonus issues uh, unless you've actually got monies available. All right, so they get funded through share, bonus share reserves or general reserves or money that you set aside. So just so you know, uh, if you're not aware when you're running your company, Remember your, when you were preparing your financial accounts, so you may or may not remember from 5013, when you do your closing entries to your P&L summary, those P&L summary goes to your, basically goes to your retained earnings account. Your retained earnings is the accumulation of your profit over a number of periods. If you want to uh, quarantine monies for specific purposes like a bonus share issue or asset replacement, you take it out of your retained earnings and you put it into a reserve and that quarantines that money so that it doesn't get paid out in dividends. Okay, so that's what your reserves are. So a quick example of a rights issue. So XY Limited had 100,000 ordinary shares issued for one dollar each. They were all fully paid. The directors decided to make a one for four rights offer to ordinary shareholders at an issue price of $1.50. So with the rights issue, they still have to pay. They're not getting them for nothing. Right, but remember, if it's issued at a discount, it can dilute the value of the share. Right, so we're going to issue them at $1.50, payable in full on application. The shareholders accepted the rights offer by the expiry date and they were allotted. So we've got 100,000 divided by four. All right, gives you 25,000 times by $1.50, gives you 37,500. Bank goes up 37,500, share capital goes up 37,500. Okay, if some of them don't, um, if they don't uh, take it up, all right, then it's just those that do take it up. So it's just the amount of money that you receive. Okay, so share options. Share options are a little bit different. Okay, gives the option holder the option to buy shares at a point in time. So depending on what kind of option that you have, you'll generally find most options these days relate to employees where directors, for example, are given the option to purchase shares in the company. Let's say the... Um, the current share price is a dollar. They might, um, but maybe it goes up to a dollar twenty. But maybe they have a an option to um, buy shares in the company 
at a dollar twenty over a two year period. So theoretically, if the price of the share goes above that dollar twenty, then it's in your to your benefit to buy those shares because if you wanted to, you could um, buy them and sell them straight away and make a profit. All right, because you're buying them for less than the market value. Now, having said that, though, you'll find that most options that relate to directors and employees, they will have an, a, like a uh, clause in there that says you cannot trade them for three to six months when you buy them, but then you can't buy them and then just quickly sell them. The problem um, that, that arose back in the 80s and the 90s is that share options, nobody used to know about them. There was no transparency, no accountability, right? It's very different now because share options are part of a director's salary. So regardless of whether they, they exercise the option or not, right, that it gets included as part of their salary. Right, what happened in the past is that um, these directors would have options and, you know, like to buy the shares at a dollar, but they're worth like $15. So that effectively what they're doing is giving themselves a, a golden handshake when they left the organisation. So they'd walk out, you know, with $20 million and nobody would know because it was all hush-hush. There was no accountability, no transparency. Right? It doesn't happen uh, like that anymore. So different types of options. You've got put options and call options, whether you've got options to buy and options to sell. You're American and you're European. European ones, you purchase, um, you purchase on a particular date. The American ones, you've got up to a certain date. Doesn't um, it's not? Um, it might have like a name, like American and European. Doesn't mean that it only happens in America and only happens in Europe. It's just the name that they've given to the types of options. There are lots of other ones as well. Yeah, they are. So the American, the American, you have the option to exercise over the entire period, where the European you can only do it right at the end. All right, so that's the main difference between those two. But there are other sorts of options and they do have clauses and everything. But with an option, you actually buy the option. So you might buy an option, uh, you know, you might pay 20 cents up front for every option, you know, or five cents or whatever. So you actually pay to have the option. Then you hold on to it for a while. And when it is to your benefit, so when the share price goes up, you buy at the lower price and you can um, make a profit. Okay, it's quite common for that to occur with uh, employees. So not just directors, with normal employees as well, where companies will give employees options. Because what it does is it creates um, a loyalty to the company and if you've got an option to buy a share, it encourages you to want to keep doing well so the share price goes up so that you are gonna benefit from it. It's used quite commonly with um, short-term and long-term remuneration packages. Okay, quick example here. On the 3rd of September 2015, XY Limited issued 50,000 options at an issue price of 20 cents per option, payable in full on application. Each option was exercisable on or before 2nd of December 2016, so basically one year later. It allows the holders to acquire one ordinary share for every two that they hold. Um, by the 2nd of September, the holders of 40,000 options exercise their options and 40,000 shares uh, were allotted. The remaining options elapsed. All right, so they gave, they uh, allowed 50,000, but only 40,000 were taken up. All right, so let's have a look at our debits and credits. So the original issue of the 50,000 options at 20 cents gives you $10,000. Bank goes up 10,000. Share options goes up 10,000. On the 2nd of September, uh, we've got uh, 40,000 that we've exercised at $2 each. 40,000 times 2, 80,000. Bank goes up. Share capital goes up. We need to um, adjust our share options account there of 10,000 and transfer that through to our share capital. However, um, part of that, so we've got 10,000 of those options um, go through to our lapsed options reserve. 
So 10,000 at 20 cents is $2,000. All right. So we got um, preference shares now. So we've got redeemable preference shares. Um, so redeemable preference shares might possibly be classified as an equity or a liability. Like similar to your debentures, depending on if it's got a set date. If a redeemable preference share has a set date that it's going to be redeemed, it's a liability. If it doesn't have a set date, then there are conditions that need to be reviewed through your financial instrument standard to determine whether it's equity or whether it's part equity and part liability. Right, so it gets quite uh, um, uh, convoluted, but you know, once you get the hang of it, it's not that um, it's not that difficult. Uh, classification depends on the rights of the shareholders, and it can be redeemed if they are fully paid up. They can be redeemed from the proceeds of a fresh issue of shares or out of retained earnings. Okay, remember, you can only redeem them if you've got the money to do so, and if it doesn't disadvantage anything else going on. So it can't disadvantage your creditors and it can't disadvantage ordinary shareholders, things like that. So um, there are rules about redemption. Um, and if there is a specific, sometimes there could be a premium that you pay on redemption as well. Right? So if, you, if and when you redeem, you might, might have to pay um, like an extra 1%, 2%, 5% or something like that. All right. You might, in your constitution, you might already have it sort of laid out. Uh, if you have a set date, if you do it before that date, you might have to pay a premium. Okay. And then that kind of, uh, if, if it's set out like that, it's pretty obvious that it's a liability. Okay. Uh, redeemable preference shares with well, the following characteristics are more in the nature of liabilities, i.e. a date. Uh, it is cumulative as to the payment of the, the dividends, meaning that you continue to owe the money. There are non-participating in further dividend distributions and priority capital return rights. All right, so that's um, characteristics of debt. Um, let's have a look in your textbook. So we can't do everything today because, you know, we only get an hour and a half. There's an example there, examples 2.9 and 2.10 in the textbook show uh, a little bit of the accounting. We'll do a simplistic one here. So we've got XY Limited, 100,000 10% redeemable preference shares issued for $1 each and they're all fully paid. On the 1st of October, all the preference shares were redeemed out of profits for $1.20 per share and cheques were issued to the preference shareholders. So we know our cash component there is obviously going to be 100,000 times by your $1.20 but we need to uh, account for those preference shares, so we need to take them out of our capital. So notice how we've got a debit to our share capital, uh, preference shares, 100,000, so we need to take it out of there, pop it into our shareholders' redemption account, which is a temporary account that we use to reconcile and pay them out. So we bring our, we're redeeming them, so we've got to bring our capital down. We're going to redeem out of our... Um, uh, profits, so it's got to come out of our retained, retained earnings, so we're going to pay a premium there of 20 cents. So you've got your 100,000 times by your 20 cents, give you your 20,000. That goes into our shareholders' redemption account. We're going to pay them 120,000, debit our shareholders' redemption, bring it back to zero, pay the cash, debit and credit. Okay, the other thing that we need to do as well if we want to maintain our capital, if we don't want to reduce our overall capital, we can transfer $100,000 out of our retained earnings and put that against our share, ordinary share capital, right, to make sure that we maintain the overall value of our equity. All right, you can only do that if you've got monies to do it, but you'll find it's a very common practice, all right, because they want to maintain the overall wealth of the company, all right? So they will, uh, won't will pay that out in dividends. They'll boost it back into your ordinary capital. And essentially what it does is it boosts the value of those shares for ordinary shareholders, all right? Because they want you to maintain, so they're better off for it. 
Okay, a number of different things you can do with shares as well. You can do share consolidations, where if you've got um, two shares for one dollar, you can consolidate one for two. You can split, so do the opposite. All right, share conversions. Any of the above are governed by the constitution. So you might want to split your shares so that uh, although it reduces the value, it might encourage a lot more trading and more people can afford to buy them if they're quite expensive. All right, but not, you don't usually find blue chip companies doing that kind of thing in a hurry because they want to, the existing shareholders want to maintain the value of their uh, the shares and the prestige that goes with having those shares. So consolidations, um, this alteration of capital has no effect on the company's total share capital, doesn't have any effect on creditors, it is just packaged differently, there's no journal entries you need to do. Share spritz, um, it doesn't have any effect on your creditors with respect to the risk. Uh, uh, often, sometimes they have a, a share split, if the number of shares is increased, with a uh, reduction in the market price per share, and this may encourage more investors to buy shares in the company. All right, so the types of companies that might do that have a very specific desire to um, get the company's shares moving and people looking at their shares and buying their shares as well. And they usually are of a lower value anyway, so it would be something like having a two or a three dollar share. So if it's three dollars, changing it to $1.50 or something like that, you'll find that the bigger companies like BHB, Rio Tinto, you know, Telstra, all the bigger, and the other big, you know, bigger companies around the world, you'll find that those kind of share splits don't happen, right? Unless they've got a particular share group uh, where they isolate it and they package it in a little, in a group for a different type of share, perhaps, um, so conversions um, can happen by special resolution of the company through repayment of capital. Um, now, share conversions, you have to be careful though if it affects, um, you know, voting rights and all that kind of stuff. So it's not an easy process to do share conversions. And as I mentioned earlier, where you've got redeemable shares, you can't, convert an ordinary share into a redeemable share. You can convert a redeemable share into an ordinary share, but you can't go the other way. The law specifically forbids it. Share buybacks, okay. So share buybacks uh, happen again uh, from time to time. Maybe you want to clean up um, some of the types of shares that you've got if you've got different parcels of shares. Um, Maybe um, you want to um, prevent a hostile takeover, so you want to buy back as many shares as you can to stop um, another company from taking over your operations. Um, legal requirements, you can't disadvantage your creditors. All right, you must um, ensure that you don't disadvantage your uh, creditors and the interests of existing shareholder rights must be protected. Right, so you can't, there have been a number of um, instances where companies have engaged in massive share buybacks and they've actually devalued the company as a whole, but that was their whole purpose. Um, they had um, <coughs> other reasons for doing it. It happened a lot in the 80s and 90s. A lot of the laws have changed now that prevent um, some of the things that um, companies were doing. Okay, there are five types of buybacks which are permissible. So a minimum holding buyback, an employee share buyback scheme, you'll tend to find that that's the main one that happens these days. All right. Other share buybacks get scrutinised very, very heavily because some companies, some of the uh, unscrupulous activities that they've enga been engaging in with their share buybacks um, has brought them under um, scrutiny from the stock exchanges and that around the world. But employee ones, when you're buying them back, you're kind of cleaning up a bit, right? Because you might have different sort of parcels and that. Um, all 
Okay, we've gone through most of those. Um, you can buy back shares to change your debt to equity ratios, defence against a takeover, clear odd lot. Some of the legal requirements, um, it's only allowed if it's not pre prejudicial to creditors. Okay, that's a simplistic, the legal side of it. Remember, this is not a law unit. This is an accounting unit. The legal side to a share buyback is actually quite comprehensive. They've got to go through a whole checklist of things and deciding you know, whether it's appropriate for sh um, existing shareholders and creditors and the like. So can get quite, um, it does get scrutinised quite heavily and it's heavily audited. Um, when you do buyback, your shares are cancelled. Okay, and when you buy them back, it could be at a premium or a discount. Let's have a look at a example. All right, so let's say in our equity accounts, we've got share capital there of 100,000, being 100,000 shares at $1. We've got a general reserve of 20,000, so that's money that we've previously taken out of our retained earnings and quarantined in a reserve. And we've got retained earnings. Remember, your retained earnings is your accumulation of profit over a number of years. All right. So that's uh, what we've got sitting in our books. On the 1st of July, the company decided to buy back 10,000 ordinary shares at $2 in order to reduce its shareholders' equity. The cost of the buyback was $2,000. And the buyback scheme is to be funded firstly by the original share capital at its original price and the excess is to be drawn equally from the reserve and the retained earnings. So let's go and work it out. Whoops, too quick. Okay, so we want to buy back 10,000 shares. So we're going to reduce our capital by 10,000. So we're going to debit our share capital there by 10,000. Our cash component is 22,000 because we are... Um, buying those uh, shares back at $2. So 10,000 times $2 gives you 20,000, plus the $2,000 worth of cost gives you 22,000. So 22,000 minus the 10,000 gives us 12,000 left, doesn't it? If we are going to distribute it equally between the general reserve and retained earnings, that 6,000 each is going to come out of there. All right, so our cash component there is 22, share capital is 10, the remaining 12 is divided equally between the general reserve and the retained earnings. Okay, so by the time you get to your journal entries, it's easy peasy. The hard bit is deciding whether you can actually do it, whether you're allowed to under the law. Okay, let's have a look at some dimensions. Let's just see where we're at with our time. Half an hour left, so we're good. Okay, so debentures, they are fixed interest securities which are offered to the general public or they could be offered to specific groups of people as well. All right, so sometimes they are offered to the public, sometimes they are offered to select groups. So a debenture may or may not be secured against property. Debentures, what that means in the event that the company goes bust, you have claims on specific property, right? whether it's buildings or something like that. It means that you get first claim. Like a um, creditor, you get claim on that property. It doesn't just get sold and go off to everybody else. Right? You get, if it's secured, you get first dibs. Okay, debentures may be issued either in a single form, that is an issue of separate debentures each for a definitive amount or as a total amount. As with shares, the issue of debentures must be preceded by the issue of a disclosure document such as a prospectus. A listed company is entitled to have its debentures listed on the securities exchange under the ASX rules. So you can trade in debentures. Right. Interest is commonly paid half yearly. Right. But it could be monthly, it could be quarterly, it could be annual. Right, and what that means from an accounting point of view, if it's half yearly, you might have to accrue interest payments if it doesn't, depending on the timing of it. Because remember, with financial accounts, we prepare 
Our core annual reports are either at the 30th of June or the 31st of December. So 99% of companies, it's either 30th of June, 31st of December. Probably about 80% are 30th of June, about 19% in December, and there's about 1% that have other dates. They have other dates because of their operating cycle and you are allowed to pick another date. So occasionally you will see an annual report, say in, I've seen them in March, April, August and September. It depends on the operating cycle of the company as to what suits them best. Very, very few. Most companies pick the 30th of June because it coincides with the tax year. Okay, but what that means, um, depending on the dates and what is half yearly for that, it might not be 30th of June, the half year might come on a different month as to whether you accrue it as at the 30th of June or 31st of December. So it depends on your reporting date. Okay, so accounting for the uh, issue and the redemption, we need to be able to do that. So if they're redeemable on a set date or after a set period of time, they could be redeemable at the company's option before maturity. They could be redeemed at par, that's original, at premium, that's extra, at discount, less. Usually when they, if they redeem them off the open market, quite often they could be redeeming them at a discount. Right? So it saves them having to pay out extra interest money on those debentures. So a premium is a loss to the company because you're paying extra, but maybe you want it back. You're willing to pay a premium because you need that debt gone off your books. Right? Um, you could redeem at a discount. Well, everybody wants to redeem at a discount if they're able to do so because it costs you less, but that is treated, those gains are treated as revenue. Funds to redeem debentures could come from a proceed of a new share issue or borrowings from an asset sale, from assets currently held, from reserves, it could come from anywhere how you redeem them. Um, debentures can potentially also be convertible to shares, right? So if instead of redeeming it, you can say, we'll convert it to shares. And then that entitles the uh, debenture holder to receive dividends in the future. But if you don't want to, if you might not want to convert it to shares, you might want your money back. Okay, so let's uh, redeem at a premium. Remember, the company is paying extra, so to them it's an expense and it's a loss. Profits come down. All right, remember your debentures are a liability. To uh, redeem it, you're reducing that liability. You're, you're reducing it, therefore you debit your debentures. Um, you're, uh, ha you're redeeming at a premium, so you're going to have an expense there for an expense to go up, you debit it, and then you've got your cash component that you pay. If you redeem at a discount, which is a gain to the company, notice how you've got a credit there to your redemption revenue account, right? Revenue is to increase your credit, okay? Your um, conversion to equity, you convert your debentures to your share capital, right? So that'll change it from a liability item to an equity item. So let's have a look at an example. So we're going to issue some debentures, 5,000, one or each of $100, which is 500,000, payable in full on application. Costs of issuing the debentures were 3,500. So upon application, so again, remember we've had a um, prospectus, people have agreed to buy, that money goes into a cash trust account, same as shares, right, on the first issuance. So debit your cash trust, 500,000, credit your application for debentures, 500,000. When you allot it, right, that application for debentures account needs to be brought back to zero, so we're going to debit that 500,000. We're going to credit our debenture liability account now by 500,000, and we're going to transfer our cash from our cash trust accounts. We're going to credit that and debit our cash 500,000. We have got further debenture costs. All right, so they need to come against our debentures there. Three, debit our debentures 3,500, credit our cash 3,500, the payment of those costs. All right, so debenture issue costs come off your debentures, similar to your share issue costs come off your core share capital. 
Okay, so let's do a redeem them at a discount. So we're going to redeem $2,100 adventures at a discount of 5%. Okay, so 2,000 times by $100 gives you 200,000. We are redeeming them, so we're <coughs> reducing our liability by $200,000. Our um, at our 5% discount, right? So technically what we're doing is we, instead of paying $100, we're paying $95, aren't we? All right, so 2,000 times by your $95 gives you your 190,000. The difference there of the 10,000 is your gain on redemption. Notice it's on the credit side, so it's treated as revenue. All right, now we've got to bring our debenture holders account um, back to nil. When we pay them, debit our debenture holders 190,000, credit our cash 190,000. Okay, so I'm going to leave you to read this little note on debentures. All right, so you will need to read this because we try to... It, debentures can be far more complicated than you uh, than what the book talks about, especially to do with the payment of your interest and your redeem what you're paying. Normally, when you redeem a debenture, any interest owing is included in the redemption value. So what you're paying, it's included in your final payment. But what you have to do is work out what component of that is interest and what component of that relates to the debenture and what's left, whether there is a revenue, whether there's a gain or whether there's a... Um, an expense, all right? So, and it can get a little bit tricky. So, um, we try to keep it simple. So, make sure you read that and, and I'll explain it a little bit more when we look at question 2.14. I think you might already have the answer to that one anyway, all right, in your homework solutions. Um, but we'll make sure that we um, clarify that Okay, and what the appropriate action is to take given in a situation where you get asked a question for an exam. Okay. Convertible notes. So uh, debt convertible to equity on maturity. Uh, the initial, it's initially classified as a liability or equity depending on its characteristics. And if it's converted to equity, then it becomes equity. But again, ASB 9 there, financial instruments, is uh, the standard that we have to apply to determine whether something is treated as um, equity or a liability. Okay, so let's have a quick look at our co uh, convertible notes example. We've got a thousand one hundred dollar convertible notes. They are nine percent convertible notes. Um, half of the notes elect to accept uh, repayment of the debt in cash. The other half want to receive uh, fully paid ordinary shares at five dollars each. All right, so we've got uh, 100,000, so 1,000 um, notes times by $100 gives you 100,000. We, our convertible notes, we bring that back to zero, so we're going to debit that and we're going to credit our convertible note holders account, which is our uh, temporary account. Out of that account, we're going to pay back 50,000 in cash. All right, so we've got 50,000 less left. That 50,000 is now going to convert to 10,000 shares. So 50,000 divided by $5 gives you 10,000. So we've got 10,000 shares at $5 to give us 50,000. Okay, dividends. So we're nearly there. Uh, there are two types of dividends. So dividends are payable, um, you know, in lieu of the fact the company is making money. So dividends are only payable if the company is making profit and that creditors aren't being disadvantaged, etc. So um, they are dis a distribution of um, monies to your shareholders. Um, let's have a look. A company must satisfy a solvency test to declare and pay dividends. All right, so directors have the power to determine dividends at any time. The law does differentiating, differentiate between determining and declaring. When you determine something, it doesn't mean that um, you have to start doing all the journal entries. Once it's been declared is when it is a legal liability. All right. There are two types of dividends. You'll find that most companies will have an interim dividend and a final dividend. All right, so they will quite often pay two dividends 
over a year. Um, the payment of these dividends um, obviously it gets paid out of retained earnings. You can't pay it unless you're making profits. Um, so dividends can only be paid if the company's assets exceed its liabilities immediately before the dividend is declared and the excess is sufficient for the payment of the dividend. The payment of the dividend is fair and reasonable to the company's shareholders as a whole and C, the payment of the dividend does not materially prejudice the company's ability to pay its creditors. So that's it in simplistic terms. Now, the other thing with dividends is you'll find that big companies will have a reserve for dividends. So even if they are making losses, they have money set aside from previous years to keep shareholders happy and continue to pay dividends. All right, even though they might be making losses. All right, and as long as your assets exceed your liabilities, all right, and that could be problematic for some companies. Remember in accounting, with accounting policy choices, where depreciation and valuation of assets, right, so under the accounting standards, how you value those assets can affect whether you pay dividends or not. So accounting numbers are important. Okay. So again, when does the legal debt arise for a dividend? When it is declared, all right? Often, um, it may require further ratification at an annual general meeting as well, all right? So they determine a dividend, then they have an annual general meeting and the shareholders agree to pay that dividend, all right? But when it is declared, that is when it becomes a legal liability. Okay, <clears throat> you might choose to use the retained earnings account to pay your dividends, but you might want to separate it out as well. So the way that companies set it up are different, you might do things differently, but really you should have a separate account so that you can easily report on the amount of dividends you've paid and you should separate out your interim and your final dividends. You should have separate accounts of these things, but it's all coming out of your retained earnings and that's where it all, all basically rolls up into that anyway when you set up your accounts. So you're paying it out of your retained earnings, debit retained earnings, credit your cash. Your final dividend, again, also coming out of your retained earnings. And at the end of the year, if you've paid it, it comes out of cash. If it's a payable, it goes to payable. Generally, you will find that your final dividend is a payable. You don't um, pay it until after your year end. So it'll be paid after the 30th of June or after the 31st of December. All right, so you have to accrue it. It's a liability and so therefore it is a payable. In the next period, remember it comes out of the payable and gets paid in cash, all right, when you pay it. Um, if you haven't worked it out yet, then you might have to do a note disclosure. Right, so doing separate note disclosures for your dividends might be a requirement if it's happening at the end. Okay, so preference dividends, we know they're normally paid before other dividends to ordinary shareholders. They have a rate um, which is uh, at a set period in time quoted as a percentage. So for example, company A has 500,000 10% fully paid cumulative preference shares which are one year in arrears. They declare an overall dividend of $200,000. So in order to pay that, if you have a cumulative um, preference dividend, they must get paid first. So 500,000 times by 10% is 50,000. So they get their, the arrears dividend gets paid um, then the current year's dividend and then the ordinary shares dividend. The remainder goes into your ordinary shares and distributed. Okay, there's a quick example there of a um, interim and a final dividend. XY Limited had 100,000 ordinary shares issued for $1 each and fully paid. They had a dividend of three cents per share. Interim dividend was declared and paid so you can see Debit your interim dividend paid, 3,000, cash 3,000, okay? And that interim dividend paid, remember, that is rolling up through your retained earnings. So if you've got retained earnings slash interim dividend, that's okay, all right? 
So some slight variations in the names are acceptable. Then on the 28th of June, we're going to declare that dividend. So two cents per share, so two cents times by the 100,000 is $2,000. We're going to debit our final dividend declared and credit our final dividend payable. Again, that's rolling up into your retained earnings. So you've got retained earnings slash final dividend declared. Now, a bonus issue. Uh, a bonus issue could be issued at, um, in lieu of a cash dividend. So you can get one share for 10. But remember, when you have these bonus, bonus issues, it uh, it is potentially diluting the value of your shares because you're increasing the number of shares. You can only um, pay bonus share issues out of your profits or reserves. So there's a debit to your retained earnings, credit to your share capital. Um, it could be used as a signal to the market of increased future profitability. Right? Because it's technically, by having a bonus share issue, you're diluting the value of your shares. You would only do that if you knew in the future that you're going to be doing well, so your share value is going to go up. All right, so it is potentially a signal. Quick example there. Got 50,000 ordinary shares issued at $2, um, all fully paid. The directors declared a bonus of one share for every five. So we've got 50,000 shares divided by five times by your um, issue price there of $2.30. Um, that comes out of your general reserves and your share capital goes up. So remember, bonus share issue, no one's paying for it, but it's funded out of your reserves. Okay, so you know what your reserves and your retained earnings are. So I'll leave you to uh, read those ones. So next week, uh, we've got business combinations. All right, so new topic area. Um, so remember for homework for this week stuff, those 2.9, 2.11, 2.30 are already up there. So, but for today's class, so we've got our, our workshop uh, tonight at six o'clock. So I will see you all there. We're going to look, do some exercise, go through the questions that we've got there. We've got a few exercises to do with the. Australian Securities Investment Commission. So those of you, if you don't have another class to go to now, then you've got a bit of time to um, have a look at some of those. Good question. Did you have a question? Oh, just thought. <laughs> oh, no, sorry. Sorry. Okay. Um, now, anyone got any questions? So we went through a lot there. Right. But, you know, we only get an hour and a half to go through it. Lots of debits and credits, the only way to get your head around it. Um, always the easiest thing to remember when you're doing any debits and credits, is your bank account affected, yes or no? So is your cash going up or down? So straight away, if your cash is going up, you know it's going to be debited. Is your cash going down, you know it's going to be credited. So you know that, that one. And for a lot of the journal entries, your bank account's going up or down. Then you start to look at, when you're looking at your share capital, have a look at the summary that I've got there for you um, for all your debits and credits. Remember, a cash trust account is always used in the beginning for the initial application for either shares or debentures. Right. And then your subsequent movements in your um, accounts, so your temporary accounts, have to come back to zero at some point. The only one that stays there a little bit longer is your calls in advance. All right, and then um, debentures gets a little bit tricky when we have to calculate interest over a number of periods. So if the debenture is like a, a, a five-year debenture and interest is payable quarterly, right, you have to accrue. Uh, if the company has a reporting period of 30th of June, you have to make sure, as at the 30th of June, that you've accounted for your interest component on those correctly. All right, so we'll look at um, we'll look at those in the workshop and see if you can practice the homework, um, and then just determine um, when you uh, if you've got a rights issue or a redemption or a bonus issue. Just you can always know one side. Your share capital is either going up or down, right? And it's usually quite easy to remember one side, and then you go through. 
and you work out can work out what the other sides are. Right? So when you're dealing with these ones, uh, it's just practice, practicing your debits and credits. Right, so we get plenty of practice next week in the workshop and we will have a, uh, a new question as well. So there'll be a new question to practice and you'll have questions to practice for the mid-semester in the study pack, okay, which I'll be putting up on Blackboard by the end of the week. Okay. All good. So I'll see you all at um, 6 o'clock. Thanks for coming today. I know it's a public holiday everywhere else, but we don't recognise those public holidays. So, But we do over Easter. So we all get a little holiday. And it's not so bad anyway because it's too hot outside. It's actually quite nice being inside <laughs> with the air conditioning. I love the world we live in with the air conditioning. It's fantastic. I don't know how how we can cope without it. <laughs> hang, hang on, hang on, hang on. Oops. Hang on, I'll just turn this off. Yes. No, 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 it just makes it hard for me when I lay down. So I just wonder, um, when we, when I do debit credit, should I put a full, um, like, fully written earning slash uh, reserve, or can I just... Well, if you know what it is, if it's general reserve, it's general reserve. If it's retained earnings, it's retained earnings. You oh, know, okay. but when it comes to paying like a dividend, those last couple that I rushed through, if you put retained earnings slash dividend, in, like interim dividend or final dividend, I'm okay with that. Okay, so All right, as long as if you had retained earnings on its own and you had in the note at the bottom payment of interim dividend out of profit, mm -hmm. that's also fine. Oh, okay. Right? All right. But you'll find that most companies they will have separate accounts, so each description represents an account code. Okay, right. So, so it's, it's up to I, I will accept the variations as okay. long as it's clear and long as it, you've got a note if you were had to write it out as long as you've got a note okay, right. if um, but remember with the like the mid semester it's all multiple oh, okay. you don't have to actually write it out but you need to you need to do all the written stuff for homework you need to write it out so you're clear in your own mind just in case you get something in the final exam oh, okay. All right. Thank you so much.